Right. So I should say, first of all, does anyone have any general topics they want me to talk about or specific questions they want me to cover? I can certainly go over one of these practices games, but yeah, Justin. Sure, yes. So, so I'm just gonna use one of these two, lady, I can't say her name very well, practices games. Is that what you, that's what you said you wanted to do, right? Yeah. And then we'll definitely we'll look for comparison tests as well. Um, so just as a reminder, right, on your exam, the sections are, I never them real good, wait, you're gonna, you're definitely gonna have to find, I would, well, here's what I would imagine. I imagine you're gonna have to find the maximum or minimum or saddle points of a function of two variables. There's probably going to be a Lagrange question. There's probably going to be some double integral questions. I wouldn't be surprised if you had to change the order of integration. There might be a volume or an average value question. That seems maybe, maybe not. Um, and then sequences and series stuff. Divergence, divergence, maybe finding the pattern. That's how I would kind of break it down. I, I feel like he might, sure, 7.5 and 7.8. I feel like he might ask um, uh, something about like the part, the nth partial sum of a geometric series. I feel like and that's come up a number of times in examples I've seen him do. So we might need to talk about that as well. Um, anyway, so we'll, we'll start on this. And then, yes, I can also look at something from 7.5, 7 which is the extreme of a function of two variables, and 7.9, which is average value stuff. We will definitely get there, which I don't actually think, I feel like the, I feel like the the practice exams from the generic A, I believe they kind of don't have any of the chapter seven. Well, they have the double integral stuff, but they don't have the extreme stuff. Let's actually start with that because that's kind of the beginning. So before we start with this practice, this practice exam, I'm gonna I'm gonna go slightly different direction here first. So let's say we wanted to do the following. Here's an example from section seven point five. Um, So let's say we have the function f of x comma y equal to one minus x squared plus x squared y plus y squared plus one third y cubed. We want to find, so we want to locate and classify the extrema. Or locate and classify the critical points. For me, as a professor, I would definitely try to write a question where there was at least two, maybe three or four critical points, and you at least got one saddle and at least one maximum. That's what I would be shooting for if I was trying to write a question. Um, so let's take the partial derivatives. fx is going to be negative 2x plus 2xy. That's it. Set it equal to zero. Fy is going to be, let's see, x squared plus 2y plus 3y squared. Looks kind of gross. So when you have something that looks terrible like this, you always want, is that right? Did I make it? Yeah. No, it's x squared. Oh, thank you. Yeah, divided by three. Good call. Yeah. I forgot to do that. Yes, that should be correct, right? Drew? of x squared times y is just x squared, there's y squared is 2y, the one third y cubed is one third times three y squared, which is x. So when you've got equations like this, deal with the easier one first. So definitely fx looks like the easier one to deal with. So I'm going to factor out a uh, 2x. I'm going to factor out a 2x, I'm left with a negative one plus y. So here we're going to get either x equal to zero or y equal to one. And I will stress, as I usually do, that that's not a critical point. Zero comma one, not a critical point. Because if you have the x equals zero and y equals one, this equation will be zero, this equation won't be. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take x equal to zero and we're gonna plug it in here. If we set x equal to zero, we're gonna get zero plus two y plus y squared equal to zero. And if we factor out a y, we get y times two plus y equal to zero. So you either get y equal to zero or y equal to negative two. So we get two critical points so far. We have x equal to zero, y equal to zero, and x equal to zero, y equal to negative two. And then we're gonna do the same thing setting y equal to one. 
if I plug in y equal to one, well, then I'm going to get x squared plus two times one plus one squared equal to zero. And we said that equal to zero, I get x squared plus three equal to zero. I get x squared equal to negative three, and I should stop there. That doesn't have any solutions. So sometimes that'll happen where one of the values that made one of your first partial derivatives equal to zero won't have any corresponding values in the other partial derivative making it equal to zero. Yeah. So set what equal to y? So I, I want to pause. One. So fx, yes. So you mean like solve for y here? Yes. Sure, but the well, it's it's actually I, I don't mean to be like critical. It's a bad thing, and here's why. If we solve for y, look what happens. You get two x y equal to two x, and then what are we going to do? Well, no, actually not. Right, because but how are you getting there? What are you doing to both sides? Right, and the problem is when you divide both sides by two x, you lose a possible solution to this equation. Here, x equals zero is the solution. Two times zero times y equals two times zero. Check. Here, that no longer appears as a solution. So the problem with dividing both sides by a variable is you often miss out on a possible solution. So I really can't stress enough, if you're trying to solve these um, first partial derivatives equal to zero, you really want to factor. That is the way to go, if you can. All right, so we've only got two critical points, zero, zero, and zero, negative two, because x squared equal to negative three, if you try to take the square root, being the square root of a negative number, and that's not real. Totally, yeah, yeah. If this if this ended up being x squared minus two minus one equal to zero, and you got x squared equal to positive three, then for sure you could say x equal to plus or minus the square root of positive three. And then you would get two critical points. You would get root three comma one and root three comma negative one. Oh, sorry, uh, I got that backwards, apologies. Root three comma one and negative root three comma positive one. Because the y value is one and the x values are plus or three. If it was the other way around. That's not what we have. So after you find all your critical points, that's when you start trying to figure out how, how to classify them which we need the second partials for. So I'm just gonna look at fx to find fxx. It's gonna be negative two plus two y. And look at fy to find fyy. Derivative x squared is zero, derivative two y is two, and the derivative of y squared is two y. And finally, I also need the mixed partial. fxy is, you can look either way, I mean, I technically I should be looking at fx and then taking the partial with respect to y. Derivative of negative two x with respect to y is zero. Derivative of two x with respect to y, sorry, two x y with respect to y is just two x. I also often like to double check if I go the other way. I would take the if I do fyx, the derivative of this with respect to x is going to be two x plus zero plus zero, which is the same. So it checks out. And it should always check out that way. All right. So then after that, we find capital D, capital D is fxx times fyy times fxy quantity squared. In this case, it's going to be negative 2 plus 2y times 2 plus 2y minus 2x squared. And then we plug in our critical points. So let's plug in 0, 0 first. We plug in 0, 0, and you're getting and I wouldn't multiply this out. I don't think it's, it, you really don't want to actually. So I'm going to get negative two plus zero, that's two plus zero minus zero squared, which is negative two times two minus zero, which is negative four. And when this capital D value is negative, that means we have what? Right. So zero, zero is a saddle. Let's look at the other critical point, which is zero comma negative two. So plug in zero negative two, I'm gonna get and see 
So negative two plus two times negative two times two plus two times negative two minus two times zero squared. So that's going to end up being, let's see, negative two minus four is negative six, and two minus four is negative two minus zero. So I end up getting 12, which is greater than zero, which means what? I don't know what the minimum is. Right, it means that the max or min, but what I really want to say is it means I have to do a little bit more work. So I'm going to check out my second partials and I see that both fxx and fyy are negative. You really only have to check one of them, right? Because they will always be the same sign if D is positive. So check one of them, which means in this case, both are concave which way? Mm, if the second derivative is negative, we are concave down like a frown which means we have a maximum. It's okay. So that so this means we have a maximum at our critical point. Sure, yeah. So the rules are if d is less than 0 I should let me ask. Let me write this on. So if we have a critical point so if say a comma b is our critical point, then you have the following three things. If the capital D evaluated at AB is negative, then we have a saddle at a comma b. If D of A comma B is positive, then one of two things can happen. You have a maximum if either FXX is negative or FYY is negative because it's concave down. And when it's concave down, you have a maximum. Or you have a minimum if either FXX is positive or FYY is positive. And you only ever need to check one of them once you get the D is positive, because they will always match each other if D is positive. Yeah. Right. Right. Correct. Yes. So, so for example, yeah. So, well, the user doesn't end up being two is the thing though. So typically if D ends up being a constant number regardless. So let me give you a quick example. If your function was say like, mm, yeah, not, oh sure, yeah. Let's say it was like four X squared plus six Y squared minus two X plus 10 Y plus two. This probably won't suck. Let's find out. So FX would be, 8x minus 2. Okay, it's going to suck a little, but not that much. And then fy would be 12y plus 10. Solving these, you get 8. So here is a case where you wouldn't factor. I mean, you could factor, but since it's a linear equation, you can just solve for x and be sure you're not going to miss anything. So you need 8x equal to 2, x equal to 2 divided by 8, which is 1. Four. Similarly, we get 12y equal to negative 10 y equals negative 10 12 which is negative 5 and if you want to find capital d let's see so d is going to be fxx is 8 fyy is 12 and fxy is 0 so d is 8 times 12 i don't really care that that's 96 but it is and notably no matter what point you plug in d is positive so D at any kind of critical point, in this case, one fourth comma negative five six is 96. But yeah, we don't really care about the value. We care that it's positive. All right, so now let me ask you, since D is positive here, 
are we going to end up getting a maximum or a minimum? Right, because both of our second partials are positive. So we're going to get a max, or sorry, a minimum because both fxx and fyy are positive. But yeah, you're right. If once d is constant, there's nowhere to plug in your point. So you just get whatever you get. Cool. Oh, and then the last thing, which probably is not going to come up, is usually not a feature of this class, but if you happen to get that D is equal to zero, then just like when the ratio test is equal to one, the test is inconclusive. We don't know based on this analysis if we have a maximum or a minimum. Yeah. Okay. All right. So hopefully um, that addressed the questions about section 7.9. Sorry, 7.5. Apologies. Um, let's go ahead and get over to this prior. So, yeah. yeah 7.9 is like the, what I think of as the volume kind of stuff. Um, but let's look at let's look at these questions here. So, and this is I don't actually remember which one this is. This is one of the two. This is an error case. This is the practice midterm 2 1. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. Are these not the same as each other? No, they're not. Okay. So, first, write two double integrals, one using dx dy, one using dy dx, to give the area of the region bounded by the curves y equals x squared and y equals x. Do not compute the integrals. So this is a lesson in making sure you read the question, right? Don't do more work than you're being asked to do. I'm just going to write the integrals. I'm not going to find what they're equal to. So I need to draw the region. Y equals X squared looks like this. And Y equals X looks like this. And where, without doing any work, where do these definitely have to intersect each other? What's one point where they intersect for sure? Right, the origin. And at the point one, one. Because we know that if x is zero, y is zero, and if x is zero, y is zero, and if x is one, y is one, x is one, y. And those are the only place, points where they cross each other. Just like if we were to verify, we could just like set them equal to each other and then factor it out. Totally, yes. The other way you could go is to be like, oh, yeah, x squared equals x. And you're right, you should factor, meaning you bring everything over to one side. And then factor out an x. So no, yeah, we get the same solution. Cool. So if I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna do dx dy first. And eh, maybe not. I don't know. Sure. So yeah, dx dy. I need the double integral of one dx dy. And I know it's a one because they asked me to find here. So here's what I would do if it was me. I would write, since it's dx dy. My inner integral is x equals something, x equals something, and my outer integral is y equals something, y equals something. Because the inner things have to match and the outer things have to match. It seems kind of backward. Well, I should say they don't have to match because what we're really going to get here is we're going to get x equals a function of y and x equals a function of y. So I'm going to draw a horizontal strip here. Say, okay, well, my left-hand side is the function y equals x or x equals y. My right-hand thing here is y equals x squared or x equals the square root of y. And it is the positive square root of y because we're on the right side of the y-axis. So then that's gonna be my upper limit. Outer limit should always be constant. They're going to be the same either way here, but we're going from a low of y equals zero to a high of y equals one. To do the other integral, to do the dy dx, I'm going to start off the same way. I'm going to just do double integral of one times dy dx. And I'm going to remind myself, well, great. Now the inner part has to be y equals to y equals, and the outer part has to be x equals to x equals. Now, if I draw a vertical strip, the lower limit is y equals x squared. And the upper limit is y equals, or did I should say the lower boundary and the upper boundary. 
And then the left-hand value for X is zero. The right-hand value for X is one. And that's all this problem is asking me to do. So I would stop there. Yeah, definitely. Uh huh. Well, it depends. What are you setting it equal to? So usually, if you're if you're trying if you've got e to the x, the only thing we can really kind of confidently solve it to is like. So like it would have to be something more like I am giving you. I want to find the area of the region between say y equals e to the x, x equals zero, x equals four, and y equals e to the four. I can give it to you like that. And then if I draw this, well, here's y equals e to the x. Here's x equals zero. Here's x equals four. And here's y equal to e to the four. So good question here. Mm, yeah, I don't feel like I've, I've, I've yeah, I know this. Mm, yeah, I feel like I've not described this super well because technically I could be describing this region here or this region here. So I'd have to use more words to be super accurate with what region I'm describing. But I will point out here that that right, you can't really set, like setting e to the x equal to x. I don't know how to solve that. It's not really easily solvable. Like really, not at all. But something like this we could go with. Okay. Um, and I guess if if I said if I said something like the region below y equals e to the x above. Um, or sorry, yeah, yeah, the y equals e to the fourth there. I guess I should have just really said not that. I should have really said y equals zero. But then that gives me y equals zero, x equals zero, x equals four, y equals e to the x, and then that's that region there, which is better. It's possible. It's not hard to do. So if we if we were given these four things. I should definitely be doing this vertically, right? If I do it this way, it's gonna be the double integral from y equals zero to y equals e to the x, and then from x equals zero to x equals four. Versus if I had given you this region instead, like I hadn't, like I'd done this. And I hadn't really specified that I should have kind of crossed out this one. Well, then if I want this region, I could actually go either way. I would probably, yeah, I would go either way. You're welcome. Okay. So let's look at this next one here. Consider the pyramid bounded below by the xy plane, above by the plane x plus 2y plus 4z equals 8, and on the side by the xz and yz planes. Not as hard as it is being made the set. Really, you have so it's bounded below, it's bounded by the three planes the xy plane, the yz plane, and the xz plane. So we're basically just saying it's in the first quadrant, and also the plane x plus 2y plus 4z equals 8. And if I find the intercepts. I'm going to have, well, if I set y and z equal to zero, my x intercept is eight. If it's at x and z equal to zero, my y intercept, well, two times y equals eight is going to be four. And I set x and y equal to zero, my z intercept is going to be four times z equal to eight gives me z equal to two. So here are my intercepts. Two, y is four, x is eight. I haven't really drawn them to scale, doesn't really matter. Oops, the shirt there. <laughs> and here's my, my, my XY plane. Sorry, my XZ plane. Here's my XY plane. 
And here's my y is equal to infinity. And then I want to set up a double integral to compute the volume of the pyramid. So here's the idea. Z is the function you want. The thing that Z is equal to is what we want to integrate here. So I would say, well, great. Volume is going to be the double integral over our region of whatever Z is equal to as a function of X and Y. So I want to take this equation and solve for Z equal to a function of X and Y. And I'll probably do dy dx because that's usually the default way of doing it if I have a choice. I need to solve it first. Because usually when we do when we find volumes, we think of integrating over a region on the floor, aka the xy plane, and integrating the height. So it's kind of like how I'm not doing yeah. So here's our I'm gonna draw the region, but we'll come back to that in just a second. So if in the xy plane. I'm going to observe that my y-intercept is 4, my x-intercept is 8. There's 4, and there's 8. So if I was trying to find the area of this region, I would draw a little vertical strip, and I would integrate from x equals 0 to x equals 8, whatever that function was. Justin? Do you get the, like, the y of x by just sending z equals 0? I, I wouldn't actually say it that way, but you're not wrong. I specifically got my x intercept by setting y and z equal to zero. And I got my y intercept by setting x and z equal to zero. If I set z and y equal to zero, I get x equal to eight. If I set x and z equal to zero, I get two y equal to eight, which is y equal to four. But the point I'm trying to make is a connection between saying, well, if I want to find the area under this curve, I'm just adding up all these rectangles whose height is the height function. If I want to find the volume under this plane, I'm going to be essentially adding up all these little rectangular prisms whose height is how far above the xy plane we are. And then we add up all of them that are in this little triangle here. So this triangle down here, that is the region R that we're integrating over. And this function here, this plane here as a function of X and Y is the thing we're going to be integrating. And it's very standard. To do. Not that it's the only way to do it, but it's kind of the only way to do it in this class. So we typically integrate whatever Z is equal to over whatever our region is in the XY plane. So here, if I solve for Z, I get 4z equal to 8 minus x minus 2y. And then I would probably just write z equal to 1 fourth times 8 minus x minus 2y. So that's going to be what the function we're integrating is equal to. So we're going to do the double integral of 1 fourth times 8 minus x minus 2y. And then the limits of integration are described by the region in the xy plane, which is exactly this region that I've drawn over here. So my y is going to go from y equals zero to y equals whatever that function is there, which I should find. So this function, well, what's the slope of that line? So close. Very close. Let me well, you're not, so you, you guys are all right, but the slope is almost one half. Are you going up or down from left to right? Negative one half is the slope of this line, right? If you're going down from left to right, definitely a negative slope, right? So from, from this point to this point, I would say the rise is negative four and the run is positive eight. So that's going to be a, a y equals negative one half x. And then what's the y-intercept? Right. So there's the equation of that line. Not too hard to find if you know the y-intercept and you can see the slope pretty easily. You could also calculate the slope the old-fashioned way by saying this is the point 8 comma 0, this is the point 0 comma 4, and doing 4 minus 0 over 0 minus 8, which is going to be 4 over negative 8, which is negative 1. That would also work to find the slope. Yeah, Justin? <laughs> And 
Yeah, I mean, if it's a plane, yes, right? If it's some other shape, then what you actually said before is great. You could have just said, I'm going to find the x, y plane like equation by setting z equal to zero. And then you're left with x plus 2y equal to 8, which is the same as that equation there. In fact, we could have done it that way too. We could have said x plus 2y equals 8 and then solve for y. Well, then 2y equals negative x plus 8 and then divide by 2 y equals negative one half x and eight divided by two is four. That would, that would, yeah, there's lots of ways to get to the right place. So then that's our upper limit of integration, negative one half x plus four. Then the x values go as far left as zero, as far right as eight. Again, an exercise in reading carefully. This problem says, set it up, do not compute the integral. So we're not gonna compute the integral. I don't know if Lee is going to do something like that, but make sure you read the questions, right? Sometimes people don't want you to actually compute the thing. Okay. The problem with using pen is things are going to start to show back to front. So this next one, you want to compute the following double integral. The integral from zero to one, from x to two x of x, y, dy, dx. Pretty straightforward. We're first, and there's no need to switch anything up here. So if I just integrate with respect to y, we're going to get, well, x just hangs out, and the antiderivative of y is y squared over 2 from x to 2x. And then we plug in first the top, then the bottom for y. So we're going to get the integral from 0 to 1 of x times 2x squared over 2 minus x times x squared over 2. We should definitely simplify this before we go any further. So simplifying this, I have x times 4 times x squared all over 2. Simplifies to, well, 4 divided by 2 is 2, and x times x squared is x cubed. Here, you get minus x times x squared is x cubed divided by two, or I would say one half. Now we integrate. We get two x to the fourth over four minus one half times x to the fourth over four. What do you mean by subtract them? You mean like, right, this is two integrals? Oh, you are told, you know what? I missed that. That's an excellent call. And you are right. I should do that. Yeah. So, so you're not, you're not wrong. No, you, I don't know why. Yeah, that's a good, really good point. I didn't see that. And I should have seen that. Two X cubed minus one half X cubed instead becomes the integral from zero to one of two minus one half is three halves X cubed. Yeah, excellent point. And then if we integrate that, we get, three halves times x to the fourth over four from zero to one. And if we plug in, we just get three halves times one fourth minus three halves times zero. We end up getting three over eight. Make a call there, which you would also get here, but it's better to do it that way. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. Sure. Okay, let's talk about sequences and series a bit. Although I will point out we didn't do a Lagrange example. Should we do a Lagrange example? Okay. Do a Lagrange example. Do I have a Lagrange example? Good question. I know I do. I don't like that example though. You know what? I'm I know you said yes, but I don't know if I have one that I think is really kind of worthy of our time. So yeah. Yeah. Just I will say here's what I'll say about Lagrange. Remember that so. So let's yeah, let's just say words about Lagrange real briefly, and then we will move on. So here's what I say about Lagrange. We've always said so, right? F of x comma y, however many variables you have, is what you want to maximize, or I should say optimize. And g of however many variables you have is our constraint. 
So typically G equals to zero, right? You have your constraint and we're sending it equal to zero. And then we take our F of X, Y, Z, Lambda equal to little F minus Lambda times little G. You take your partials, F X, F Y, F Z, Set them all equal to zero. And I should point out, right? Actually, I, I really should point this out. The partial here is just fx minus lambda times gx. The partial here is just little fy minus lambda times gy. The partial here really is just little fz minus lambda times gz. And if you set this equal to zero, then you want to solve for lambda. Not everybody does it this way. I think it's the way that works best. It's what I recommend doing. So here we end up getting lambda equal to fx over gx, lambda equal to fy over gy, lambda equal to fz over gz. You could really just jump to this even if you actually wanted to. I mean, I, he probably wants you to show the work that was actually doing the process, so you shouldn't. And then pair them up. Set these two equal to each other, set these two equal to each other. An equal, an equal. And then your job is to get all the variables in terms of one variable. So typically it ends up working out as you get X as some function of Y and get Z as some function of Y and then plug those back into your constraint. Plug into G of X, Y, Z equal to zero and then solve for Y or whatever you happen to have gotten each variable in terms of the other ones as. It often works out being y because both of these equations usually end up solving for y kind of, or having to solve it in terms of y, but you can do it any way you want. But this is kind of the general process for Lagrange. It's a bit of a process, but it does work. Okay, but that's all I really want to say about it because we should, we should, we should take the last 10 minutes here. I know time just keeps flying by to talk about sequences and series just for a hot minute. So let's see, let's look at this pattern here. Find the general term of the sequence and find its limits. So I've got five over one, five over two, five over four, five over eight, five over 16. It looks like the next term, in fact, it's a good idea. What's the next term? Five over, right, and then five over. So let's say every time I'm multiplying the bottom by two, or I could also think of it as the bottom is a power of two. This is, five over two to the zeroth, five over two to the first, five over two to the second, five over two to the third, five over two to the fourth, et cetera. I would assume that he, if he asks you a question like this, you're probably gonna start the sequence at n equal to one. So I would say a sub one equals five over two to the zero. A sub two equals five over two to the first. A sub three equals five over two to the second. A sub 17 equals five over two to the what? Right, you see the pattern. A sub N equals five over two to the what? Right. I would encourage you, if you have to do something like this, pick some way later number that you don't actually have written already out there and ask yourself, how do I get that? Usually, I'll, so technically it's fine to do it either way, but I would imagine we've usually been doing it starting at n equals one and he might request that. Um, but yeah, you could, on the other hand, if you wanted to, you if you just couldn't get it to work, you could say, well, I'm gonna say that a sub n equals five over two to the n and I'm starting at n equal to zero. You can write it like that and probably at least receive some partial credit if you specifically want to do sort of one. Okay. Oh, yeah, I've kind of got a backside here. Do I have a backside of the other page? Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. Got papers everywhere. Apologies. It was not the best. Darn it. Darn it. Sorry, I've got too much paper. Too much. It's all over now. Okay, so yeah, I think. I guess not. I guess I'm just losing my mind. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, okay, great, work. Explain the meaning. Oh, that's weird. I didn't do that. Sorry. Oh, wait, so did we find the limit? Or... No. Oh, yeah, you're right. It did ask us to find the limit. Sorry. Right. You seem to keep dragging my favorite thing more. Apologies. So, right, find this and find its limit. So, we take the limit, n goes to infinity. Well, before we even take the limit, what do we think is going to happen here? What's happening in this sequence? The denominator is getting larger and larger and larger. So we would expect the limit to be what? Right, we would say it to be zero. And I think there's not really a lot of work to show other than just saying, yeah, the denominator is getting really big. That's going to be five over infinity, which is going to be zero. I don't think there's really any other work to show. For this. I think so, if it, yeah. Okay. So explain the meaning by definition of the following equality. The sum from k equals one of bk equals five. So what I would say here is that this means that the series, the sum from k equals one to infinity of b sub k converges to five. Or if you like, you could even say the sequence of partial sums of partial sums where S n is equal to the sum from k equals one to n of b k, which is b1 plus b2 plus all the way to b n this sequence converges to five, meaning the limit as n goes to infinity of Sn must be five. I can see him, I, yeah, I don't know, I, it's hard to know. I don't think he would ask a question like this, but it's good to know. Anyway, here's a better question, I think. The second part, all right, this series converges to five. What can you all tell me about the limit as n goes to infinity of b sub n? There's only one right answer for what this limit is equal to. Let me ask you a different question. The, the sequence. Right, the sequence. What's the limit of the sequence? Let me ask you a different question. What if the limit of the sequence was two? What could you tell me about the series? Zero. Wait, wait, wait. Limit, limit, as in the first is zero. So, so you, you're, so, so if the limit of the sequence, oh, you're saying the answer to the question. Yeah. Yeah, right. The limit of the sequence must be zero because the series converged. Yeah. Right? Because what I'm really saying is if the limit of the sequence is not zero, Right, the series diverges. The term. Right, this is like the, the this is what the, is called the contrapositive of the nth term test. We're, we, we're saying if you know the sequence has a limit that's not zero, then the series diverges. So then you work that backwards. If the series doesn't diverge, meaning converges, then the sequence can't have not been zero, meaning it has to have a limit of zero. Right. The only way the series can converge is if the limit happened to be zero. That doesn't guarantee convergence, but it does mean that it could converge. It is. Sequence. Sequence converges to zero. The series might converge, like in this example, might diverge. Here's an example I think you should all keep inside your head. This series. What does this P series do? Diverges. What's the limit of the sequence? Right. What does this series do? What's the limit of its sequence? Right. So if the sequence converges to zero, the series can do anything. It could converge, it could diverge. 
after that, after you get a certain spot, that just doesn't fix the problem. This is a P series question. But because P is greater than one. Right. Here, here we get convergence because P equals two, which is greater than one. Here we get divergence because P equals one, which is less than or equal to one. I'm well, yeah, but I'm not using the I'm not using the unfirmed test here. I'm pointing out the yeah. the um, inability of the unfirmed test to say anything about this series. Uh, like right. Well, again, unfirmed test only shows right. The unfirmed test can only show that the series is divergent. Justin. So, so we have, so I'll say we have shown that for any sum of one over n to a power where that power is higher than one, the p series and it's convergent. Oh. But so, so, right. So, I'm not using the nth term test here. I'm just pointing out that, hey, you couldn't use the nth term test here to show anything. If you took the limit of the sequence, what do you get? Zero. What does that mean? Jack shit. Take the limit of this sequence, what do you get? Zero. What does that mean about the series? We don't know anything. We can use other means and ways to say, well, I know that this series diverges because P equals one, and this series converges because P equals two. But knowing that the limit of the sequence is zero only means that the series could converge. So right. They are all about series. The nth term test is also about a series, but we're taking the limit of the sequence to say something about the series. Um, yeah. Alternatively, just to, to point out, right, if the limit of your sequence, like, so say for example, yeah, let's look at this. I know we're almost out, we're out of time, but let's look at this last example here. So here's a series, sum from n equals zero to infinity of three times n plus one over n plus seven. Your teacher is going to give you something maybe like this. He's going to expect this to be really easy for you because we can say that this series, well, if you look at the limit, if n goes to infinity of three times n plus one over n plus seven, you only need to say what this is equal to. What's it equal to? Great. So then we can say that the series does what? Right. And that to me is enough for you. Right, you you really to show a series if you have a limited sequence being not zero, take a limited sequence, say what it's equal to, not zero. You might even write not zero, and then great, the series, the series diverges. This sequence converges to three. That means its series has to diverge because its sequence converges to not zero. Okay. 